So we're here to talk through this graffiti snake puzzle by Frasana. It combines uh, sets of steps that may be common if you've done paint by numbers or nonogram puzzles. The, the, the style goes by a lot of names, um, particularly how the outside clues work. But it also critically uses a set of snake deductions or path deductions, which are what this video will try to help with. The ways to start always in a puzzle like a paint by numbers is to go to rows that have a lot of clues, but particularly very large clues. These two rows stand out because they each have four total clues and two of them are five. This also looks pretty large. Um, the rest of them are, are small, more in the small, kind of small category, but there'll be ways these edge clues, just because we have a snake, will also be pretty important. And that's because of thinking what it means to have the snake uh, touching or separating these groups. Why don't we actually start with that first deduction here, as this is, this is the most snake-like uh, way to think, uh, which is that along an edge, if a snake comes in, let's say a snake came in here, it has to move at least two more cells, a total of three, before it can turn back. And that's because a snake can't uh, be adjacent to itself. When it's a one-cell-wide path, uh, it has to always take three. And so in a snake, we can write the requirements that there are at least three cells between each of these regions. And once you actually see that, where we have uh, at least one for each question mark, we have 1 plus 3 plus 1 plus 3 plus 1 plus 3 plus 1. We have 13. And this puzzle is 13 cells wide. And so one break-in that's available immediately at the start is actually just filling in the stroke completely. We're going to come back to that in a, in a second, but that's like one way to get into this puzzle, and one way this is actually much easier if you know how snakes behave along edges. I'm going to focus on this row three from the bottom, which is maybe more often where people will be starting. And with a row like this, how you often first approach it in a paint by numbers is to think about uh, how it would fill in if you moved all the clues as far to the left as you can. And then later, how look, would it look if you moved all the clues as far right as you can? And there'll be some overlap in the cells that both the two and five take in this situation. Um, so if these first two cells are shaded, this is unshaded. This is shaded for this question mark. This is unshaded. This would be one, two, three, four, five. With this being the rightmost cell of this five group, we'd have an unshaded and, and a shaded. And there's effectively 12 cells reflected if we say that there has to be at least one. I'll, I'll mark one plus, I guess. There has to be at least one plus white between these. We effectively have 12 cells shaded with, with the question marks being at least one plus and these other marks being one plus two and one and one and one is five, another five and one and one is 12. Coming from the right, we would could potentially shade, leave unshaded, have one, two, three, four, five. This being the leftmost cell of this five when we push it all the way to the right, and then <coughs> unshaded, shaded, unshaded, and one or two. And so there's actually a space where if this cell is taking, if this row is taking as many as 12 of the 13 cells just based on how it's clued, one of the cells of the two and four of the cells of the five clue are forced because there's only one cell of slack. There's one cell where different pieces can move to the right one or to the left one and still have this fill in. And so one way people will start this at the start is to see that these cells are shaded just based on that available movement space. There is a shaded cell here. There's a shaded cell here. There's an unshaded cell here and here and here. And uh, we can do something similar up top uh, in this row. And I think here it's, this is the rightmost of this five and this is the leftmost of this five. It's not as helpful, but these can be marked in at the start for those going through this puzzle. But the second really key deduction uh, is still coming back to this row three from the bottom and it's, it's another path deduction and it's thinking about if this is a line in the grid, and this is true in any loop or path puzzle, in this case, uh, consider both of these ends are on the top side of this line. If I have something that's coming down, it's got to come back across. So if I cross this line once, I need to cross it a second time to get back to the other side. If I come down a third time, I have to come back a fourth time over here. There's a parity constraint, which is across any line in the grid. 
you need to have an even number of ends, whether that's zero, two, four, six coming across. And right now we effectively have three ends marked in the grid. And even if one of these became two plus, the, the snake would effectively just cross it once. And so we have one, two, three ways we're getting across the grid. We need to have one more way back. And so there's got to be an X on one of the two ends of the snake. And uh, that will be able on its own to give us some deductions as soon as we actually use the first column clue of any of these. The only one that can use is this one. And that column clue says that either the first or second shell cell shaded in this column is a singleton, which means there's a, a white uh, cell here. This white cell with a space that just has two rows for it has to have one end that's coming to the right and one end coming to the left. There's no way this has two ends to the same side. Again, it needs to be three wide to go across. Um, and with that being accounted for, this end to the right is this end. There's no ever extra end on this side of the puzzle. This is impossible. It's going to link up and cross here. This end is going to come in and it's going to end up crossing here. And so there are two ways to start in this puzzle that are both snake based. The easiest is what we will mark now, which is this bottom row. But the other is to look at this row <coughs> and see that we need to have four total ends and the ends have to pack to the left. And so there's a way that we're going to see that that cell is, is white and everything will, will, will place in after that. So let's mark this. We said that what this looked like was a shaded cell, the snake doing a snake thing, shaded cell, snake coming in and coming out, shaded cell. If you actually got that at the start, you'll see that's a pretty easy way to be beginning. Um, this cell, which is the start of a five long clue, actually makes the deductions we'll have here easier to see, but we have effectively this end of the snake that needs to stay separated and move out. Th these ends that will come connected. This end and this end need to stay separate, so this is going to have to dodge like so. Uh, we know from this row that this is used, used, shaded, and so when these are used, the snake goes through them. We don't know for sure if these connect or not yet, but what we can do is work a little bit off this side of the grid and work off these column clues. Um, with a 2 uh, marked up top and already in the grid, we know that it has to be uh, white right above and with a 5 up here marked off the grid, it's got to be white and turn like this. And when we put in these cells, we can actually put in one more and one more, which are these, because this has to turn. The next kind of shading this group is expecting is too large, and this is only a one large space, so this has to be white, and that means that the snake continues through it. Everywhere you draw the snake path, adjacent cells, including diagonally adjacent cells, can be shaded like I'm doing here. I just shaded one cell that's going to be part of a two large group, so I can shade one more, say that's going to be white. Here's now a cell in the corner. It's got to do this. It's got to continue in a corner one more. That now connects to an end of the snake, so we can shade our ways all around it. These ends connect. This stays separate. This is the five large group we're shading in. These ends have to keep staying away from each other so that it's a valid snake. So we finished all of those clues uh, successfully. We had at the star of the grid this comment about the rows and leaving enough space for the snake to come in and out. The same thoughts are up here. We actually have a seven large space uh, between these right now. But the main thing is between this question mark and this question mark, you need to have three. And uh, what we'll see is that the snake could come in like this, but we need to shade the space we have perfectly to give enough room for there to be another part of the snake along this edge. And that forces this. The three that's here and the two that's here both give us a lot of quick shading at this moment. And we actually start to shade in this row two now. And so this five also gives us some quick work. These ends are still going to want to avoid each other, so this is going to come out. It's got to, got to extend. 
this is going to come out, it has to keep dodging, and it connects to this end. And again, everywhere the snake has its path set, we can draw uh, shaded cells in the diagonally adjacent pieces. We now can do a little bit more creatively uh, in some of these spaces. This three question mark, this is the question mark group that's going to come over here, but this white section, everything to the right of this white section is white, which gives us this. We only have one more cell shaded here, and that's this cell, so this is all white. This comes up, this has to come across, this has to keep dodging itself. We have all the cells in this column that are marked shaded now, so this is, comes down. The snake continues like so. A two cell wide area the snake can't come in and out from, so all of these are shaded cells. But we'll now see in this column we've marked the top of this three, so everything above it is white and part of the snake. That gives us this. Two and two, this is the start of the two group. And that uh, finishes out the grid. So not, not a very, very hard puzzle, but not too easy either. It does require you to know a little bit about paint by numbers puzzles. We talked at the start about how to use rows like this and get the start of shading areas like the fives, but Really, for this puzzle, it's using snake rules, and some of the snake rules you saw me talk through at the start, the idea that along an edge, you'd always take swaths of three or more cells, uh, in this case, to take many, many more cells, but you see this four, this three, five, They're, the minimum is three to get in and out of a, of a group, and that actually forces this uh, row immediately. If that were obvious or not, it actually also influences the top of the grid when we get this column coming up and we have five cells left and need to have two question marks with some snake in between. And the other snake rule, which was critical, we showed was this idea of when you're crossing a boundary of the grid, and we can do it anywhere else. Here you see there are two crossing this line, two crossing this line. There are four crosses, uh, one, two, three, there are actually six crossing this line, and it can work on a a boundary edge or in a cell, but the idea is as you go across you always have to maintain an even parity, except where you're splitting the two ends, like between this and this there are an odd number that cross, uh, because one end has to go over to eventually connect back up. And so that kind of parity constraint helps you set where the whites have to go in this row if you did miss what was going on in the bottommost row. So a few different options to do the puzzle, but they all require thinking ahead about the snake a lot more than, than uh, you may be familiar with. We're going to have a whole week of snake puzzles later in September, so hopefully you learned a little bit from this video, and we'll see you again soon.